Okay, this is a quick and dirty on our new Aspen Avionics Pro Max 2000 PFD and MFD. I've gotten in the airplane and simply turned the battery switch on. Turning on the Avionics, you'll notice, does nothing for the Pro Max. It turns on our stack and our Integra. However, we have two switches down here, toggle switches for the Aspens, the PFD and the MFD. When I turn those on, very shortly, they will begin booting up. They go through their ground check, checking all of the different components of the system. Once that's done, it'll come up and tell us the database effective dates so we can double check those. The PFD only uses the terrain and obstacles for synthetic vision. It doesn't use any of the Jeppesen updates for approach plates, or I should say Seattle Avionics updates for approach plates. You can see the PFD is done booting up and it says the Jeppesen database, which again is obstacles and terrain, uh, is expired. Uh, Aspen says most guys only update that once a year because terrain really doesn't change. So I can press the knob to accept that. Takes a little bit longer for the MFD to boot up. And that one I have updated the databases from both Jeppesen and Seattle Avionics. You can see the Jeppesen database is good through 7 August. Also the charts database is good through 7 August as well. Uh, we have AOA installed, but it is not yet calibrated, so we can't display it. I hope this week to get up with Rob, the avionics guy, and get that calibrated so we'll be able to work that. Again, push either knob to accept that, and you can see our synthetic vision is already displayed. I'll start off talking about the PFD. It's the one we're going to be using uh, most for aviation, and it's the simplest one. The buttons and controls on the MFD are very similar, but there's a lot more choices on there. First thing you notice is that we have a, in a cyan above each of these buttons the standard, which is heading on the right, course on the left. Once we're in, uh, once the GPS has a flight plan in it and is connected to the satellites and everything, um, here we go, I just turned it on. Uh, you can see now that we have a, a first waypoint, Garmin which is 135 degrees, 10 miles away. And you notice the A next to the course, that means it's auto course. So as we connect to nav or GPS steering in flight, it will continue to track the flight plan in the GPS and we no longer have to come in and select a new course on our CDI or HSI um, it will automatically update it for us. It's showing GPS position fail on here because we come over here and see if we go to home and go down to system GPS status. Well, it is connected to all the satellites and should be good. Let's look at our flight plan and you see we don't have a flight plan in the number one GPS. That waypoint Garmin was from the number two GPS, although now it's connected to the localizer 10995 in VLOC. If we try to step through, we'll see VLOC 2 is not available yet because we don't have an approach in there. We don't have a, a, a good nav frequency in the number two GPS. So it's looking at VLOC one for the GPS. And you, you notice we can't select GPS as a wake, as a nav source. And that's simply because I don't have a route of flight in the GPS. I'll go ahead and add a waypoint in here. Let's just go to Athens via VOR, oops. Okay, and there's Athens, I'll enter that. Now that we have an active waypoint, now you notice it automatically switched to GPS-1, 
auto course and we have Athens 099 degrees at 32. That other waypoint was from the number two GPS, the GNS 430, which apparently I still had a waypoint in there from the last time I loaded it. Well, now I don't know where it was getting that because there's no active route of flight in the number two GPS either. But now we can go from GPS one or VLOC two. If I come over here to the number one VOR and I change this to an active waypoint, I mean a, a good frequency, we have that. Uh, but you see it's selected a GPS, so I have to come over here to default nav and change that to VLOC. Now it has the ILS approach to 25 here at LZU in there, and we got VLOC 1. And now you notice the course is not auto, so we would have to come in here and tune the inbound course, which I think is 249 uh, for the ILS approach to runway 25 here at LZU. Heading you can change here. And you see you have a heading bug, and it has the breadcrumb trail leading out to it uh, initially to make it easier to find the heading bug, and that will go away after a few seconds. We have different menus that we can go through um, on here. You notice the top soft key on the side says one of two. If I go to page two, that's where we get our synthetic vision, and we can step through the different choices of synthetic vision. Here is SV1 that turns the entire um, ProMax 1000 into a synthetic division display, a synthetic vision display. I find that to be a little bit too much, so I prefer to step through to SV2 where you only have synthetic vision up on the attitude indicator and you have the more traditional HSI on the bottom. We also have uh, synthetic vision three which breaks it into two different boxes but you're still showing synthetic vision on both along with your obstacles and terrain and everything showing up on the 360 and then if you step through then it goes back to off so i like to leave that in uh, synthetic vision two this is field of view one which is a little bit narrower. If you go to field of view two, you see it's a wider uh, arc that you're looking at up there. Um, we have the barrow bug down here at the bottom. If we listen to the ATIS, we can select that and you notice that turns magenta and that means that we can adjust the barrow bug setting here. And it looks like it's probably about 3011. I haven't listened to the ATIS, but that's got to be pretty close. And then, again, you can either reset, reselect Barrow to turn that off, or you can just wait. Uh, I think it's about 10 seconds, and it goes back to heading on your right-hand knob. Go back to page one. We have uh, other choices in here. Minimums is really cool. We can set that, and you can see I've got 1240 set in for the ILS minimums for runway 25. And as you are coming down on the glide slope, you will get an approaching minimums call and then a minimums call. can turn that off. Uh, this is in 360 degree mode. We can also put it in arc mode on the bottom and that's purely pilot preference, what you like best. Uh, VSI, in a lot of the documentation you'll see this fourth soft key down says GPSS. The reason ours doesn't say GPS steering is because we select GPS steering directly through the DFC-90 autopilot. So we don't select it, toggle it on and off up on the PFD like legacy systems would have to do. Uh, so you can select VSI and then you notice again the legend turns magenta, you get the box. You can adjust the target VSI and while you're flying you can select vertical speed on your autopilot and you'll notice even sitting on the ground you'll see the elevator coming up to try to establish that 500 foot per minute rate of climb. If I turn the autopilot off there's a number of ways to do that. I can 
turn it off there. We get the warning, just click that again. Of course, you can double click your trim button to get rid of the autopilot. Uh, you can pull the circuit breaker. I don't know why anybody would ever do that, but those are the ways you can disconnect the autopilot. So that's basically, in a nutshell, what you've got on the primary flight display. On your MFD, it's set up much the same way. You have the Cyan legend above each of these buttons telling you what you're looking at. This one says page one of three, and page one is a full screen display. Page two is a double screen display. And again, you have to get it to magenta to adjust it, and simply by clicking it twice, turned it magenta, and says, okay, I'm going to go to page two. And in this case, I've got traffic in the top, and I've got terrain and obstacles in the bottom. And then three is what they call a thumbnail uh, view, where you have three different ones, and you can change what's in that view. You can push to select the window. You notice the magenta box going around the timers, so that means that I'm going to select that window. Uh, push it again, it jumps up to the traffic, and then you push it again, goes to terrain. So once you've selected that, you can decide what box you want to have showing on that particular part of the thumbnail. Uh, angle of attack would normally be showing up there, but you see it says Cal. We haven't calibrated it yet. Um, it brings over, we set the barrel bug over here in the PFD and it brings it over to the MFD for you automatically. We'd obviously have to come back to our steam gauge um, to set it as our backup. We still have our airspeed and altimeter as a backup from the, uh, the legacy instruments. And I have to be honest, the first time I flew this, I didn't even realize I was doing it, but I found myself reading the airspeed off our old airspeed indicator instead of on the airspeed tape. So that's something I'm just going to have to get used to, uh, really looking more at the PFD and getting my scan down uh, really low. Uh, when you get down to these timers, you now you, um, you select page, you see it says page one of four, two of four just changed to that timer, three of four to that timer, and four of four to that timer. You can't change the departure time. It will automatically um, start running for you when you start your takeoff roll and will display what your departure time was. Your flight timer will start running automatically with no input from you on your takeoff roll as your airspeed increases, and it'll stop when you get below I think it's 30 knots on your landing so if you're doing touch and goes and you don't get below 30 knots I don't think it's going to stop your flight timer but if you're doing a full stop it will and that gives you uh, an exact time from takeoff to landing uh, I've reset the name on this fuel timer too originally it just said timer two uh, let me get back here and then step back up there and that's a countdown uh, count it's counting up right now. I can tell it count down and I pre-selected 30 minutes in there So that all you have to do is hit your start button and it starts counting down And you'll get a notification at the end of 30 minutes, which I use to swap tanks every 30 minutes So very convenient feature there. We can go back to uh, page one and look at the different views on page one, which again is the full screen, this is the only screen you can display charts on. Pretty much everything else you can display in the segments of the dual screen or the thumbnail, but charts, again, only here. So as we start clicking through, you notice the view button went from cyan to magenta saying, okay, now you're selecting what you want to look at. Here is terrain, uh, traffic, um, of course I've got the Altimeter, the uh, transponder in standby, so we're not displaying any traffic now. Um, this is our shows lightning strikes if our storm scope was working, but unfortunately, our storm scope doesn't work anymore. Uh, and here's the charts. The charts you notice when they first come up are impossible to read because it's so small and you just change that with the range button so you can zoom in on it and it shows your own ship on the chart and then this says push to pan so you push that and now this becomes horizontal 
this one becomes vertical so you can come down if you wanted to look at what the minimums are 1239 we set that 1240 because you can only get to the nearest 10. press it again to cancel the pan um, you can of course come down here look at your missed approach instructions you can look at your initial altitude uh, 3,000 feet within 10 miles, 2,800 crossing the locator outer marker, and then down to the minimum. So everything is easily accept, accessible on that screen. We of course still have our standard Integra EX5000 MFD that shows our, uh, it'll show traffic. Right now it's showing uh, weather. We do have that displayed on that, the US radar. It'll show our terrain uh, and traffic and um, obstacles on there as well as our route of flight. You see, you see it shows LZU to Athens is already on there. Uh, so in a nutshell, that's how these things work. One important thing to remember is we truly do have uh, several different systems. We have the GPS, the GTN 650 is our number one, the GNS 480 is the number, or 430 is the number two GPS, and we can select those on there, but you have to have it in the right mode on here. So we gotta have GPS showing here in order to display GPS up here. So they are completely separate. So you've got the autopilot, your GPS, and your Aspen uh, avionics, which are three separate systems that talk to each other, but you got to remember where you have to make the changes in order to display it and fly it on the uh, on the PFD and MFD. I highly recommend that you get into the manuals and read at least section, I think it's chapter three for both the PFD and the MFD, as well as reading the manual for the DFC-90 autopilot. It's a very uh, useful, very precise uh, autopilot. I think you're gonna find a huge difference over our old s -Tech 55 in the way that it flies the airplane. It's much more precise and much smoother Plus, we can select a new altitude. I didn't, I didn't show you that, but under this heading button, if you press it and press it again, it goes to altitude, and now you can pre-select your altitude. So if you're going to climb to 5,500 feet, you can pre-select that on the ground. And once you climb up in vertical speed mode or in IAS mode, whatever you choose, and you get uh, to that altitude, it'll capture and maintain that altitude. Uh, that's about all I can think of for today. Um, again, get into those manuals, read them, get up and fly the airplane in VMC and become very familiar with it before you attempt to fly IFR in this airplane. Have a great day.